Many followers of TIA have reached out to us asking for our thoughts on the Amazon Synod of October 2019 convened by Pope Francis. At this time, TIA would like to respond by first introducing or reintroducing a work published in 1977 by Professor Plenio Correa de Oliveira entitled Indian Tribalism, Communist Missionary Ideal for Brazil in the 21st Century. In it, he exposed a large number of Catholic prelates spreading a new conception of missions. This new conception presents indigenous tribalism as the ideal for the future of the church and society. It accuses white European descendants, including the missionaries, of being oppressors. The solution to this oppression would be to destroy Christian civilization and replace it with a regime modeled after the Indian tribe. This book was written 43 years ago for Brazil. Today, with Pope Francis and the Amazonian Synod heralding in the same tenets for the whole world, we see that it was, and is, a truly prophetic work. Tribalism is at the door affecting our lives and our futures, becoming the new reality. This video will summarize the main thesis of Professor Plenio's book. It will be divided into three parts. First, the traditional Catholic concept of the mission and its effects on temporal life will be explained. Second, the progressivist idea of mission will be given, showing how it conflicts with the immutable doctrine of the church. Third, a series of texts from progressivist prelates and missionaries will be presented followed by commentary from Professor Plenio. We at TIA encourage you to read this timely work, which can be found in the library section of our website, traditioninaction.org. We hope this will begin to answer some of your questions and show the agenda being implemented. For nearly 20 centuries, the concept of the Catholic mission, its aims and its methods, are perfectly defined. Mission comes from the Latin word missio, from mito, that is, I send. The missionary is thus someone who is sent by the church in the name of Jesus Christ to non-Catholic peoples in order to bring them to the true faith. The church teaches that the normal way for a man to be saved is to be baptized and to believe and profess the doctrine and law of Jesus Christ. To bring men to the church is, therefore, to open the gates of heaven to them. It is to save them. This is the purpose of the mission. This salvation has the extrinsic glory of God as its supreme end. The soul that has made itself similar to him through the observance of the law amidst the struggles of this life is saved. Thus, this soul will give glory to God for all eternity. The glory of God and the eternal happiness of men are the highest missionary goals. This does not prevent the mission from having temporal effects that are also very elevated. Indeed, God created the universe in a sublime and immutable order. And since man is the king of this universe, this order is admirable above all in what relates to him. The precepts of the natural order are expressed in the Ten Commandments, confirmed and perfected by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the observance of order in any sphere of the universe is the condition necessary not only for its conservation, but also for its progress. This is true above all for men. It is impossible to Christianize seriously without civilizing. Likewise, it is impossible to de-Christianize without disordering, brutalizing, 
and forcing a return to barbarity. To be a missionary in the Americas is mainly to take the gospel to the Indians. It is also to provide them with the supernatural means to reach their celestial goal. It is to persuade them to free themselves from superstitions and barbaric customs that enslave them in their millinery stagnation. It is to civilize them. While the Christianized and civilized man progresses continuously in the exercise of his intellectual and physical activities, the Indian is a slave of a stagnant immobility, which, from time immemorial, has hindered all possibilities of true progress for him. The true missionary of Jesus Christ has the right to say to the Indian, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. For the Indian, Contact with the missionary brings contact with civilization, Western civilization, as it is concretely. He will benefit spiritually and physically from its authentically Christian ferments and would be harmed by the germs of decadence and neo-paganism when they appear in this civilization. Although Western civilization can no longer be called Christian, being submerged as it is today in total decadence, it still feels the beneficial action from the warm rays of the Son of Justice, our Lord Jesus Christ, that endure from the long centuries of fidelity. Hence, it is inconsistent, simplistic, and even fanatical to claim that, by coming into contact with Western civilization, the Indians have nothing to gain and everything to lose. In practice, due to its dazzling technological advancements, our civilization will soon reach all Indians, with or without missionaries. So, it would be better for the Indians if, along with this neo-pagan civilization, they also receive missionaries of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever it goes, the neo-pagan civilization is often accompanied by the communist agitator, the missionary of Satan. The example of Africa shows how earnestly international communism has strived to take advantage of the aboriginal tribes. Communism will sooner or later try the same with non-civilized Indians. Moreover, who can guarantee that communism, having once infiltrated Catholic circles, will not use bishops, priests, or religious to influence the Indians. Therefore, the good missionary has every reason in the world to approach the Indian, if only to warn him against the communist missionary. The progressivist concept of mission is completely different from the traditional doctrine of the church. Its aim is to establish a new order, which would be the real kingdom of God on earth. This new order aims to reverse the egoism or selfishness of man, starting with the elimination of private property, which is considered as an unjust privilege and the start of many other injustices. Therefore, this new order, which is false, treats egoism as the enemy. This egoism appears when man breaks his bond with the collectivity in three ways. First, when he wants to provide pleasures for himself apart from society, which leads to him slighting society in favor of himself. This is referred to as fruitive. Second, when man produces more than what he needs, and keeps what is left over for himself, rather than for collective use. This appropriation is born from egoism and is an insult to equality, the supreme form of justice. It was this egoism 
that gave rise to the institution of private property, which is nothing more than the institution of theft, because it is giving to one person what actually belongs to everyone. This is referred to as appropriative. Third, when this proprietor, no longer content with what he has, begins to want everything, from this comes competition. Through production, trade and money, the proprietor seeks to own everything, including what belongs to other owner thieves and society. From this comes capitalism, where competition is constantly concentrating goods into the hands of a few, thus marginalizing multitudes of the poor. This is referred to as competitive. Now, according to the traditional Catholic conception, man has a tendency toward egoism, but he is not all egoism. Egoism is only a moral deformity in him. The use that man makes of his intelligence, his will, and his sensibility to provide for his own individual good, in conformity with the law of God and the natural order, is not condemnable, but virtuous. It is a corollary of the fact that man is intelligent and endowed with a will. Therefore, a person, not a thing, and has a transcendental end. Man is thus the owner of himself. It is true that man has duties toward his neighbor and, consequently, toward his family and country. But he does not live solely or principally for one or the other. Fundamentally, he lives for God and himself. And even from the point of view of the common good, each man provides for the common good, first of all, by providing directly for himself. On the contrary, in this new progressivist conception, man is not seen as a person who has an immediate finality in himself and a transcendental end in God. Rather, he is viewed as part of a whole, and that part lives for the whole. Separated from the whole, According to the view presented by the neo-missiology, man is worthless and, so to speak, nothing. Neo-missiology considers that man receives everything from the whole, every inspiration, impulse, and, one could almost say, life itself. It seems undeniable that the formation of the modern babels, or huge urban concentrations, resulted, among other factors, from the intemperate and unwise use that man made of the machine and other technological advances that came at the beginning of the 19th century. In varying degrees, this occurred in all societies of the West. The egotistical directors of political or economic power have contributed toward these results. The multitudes also contributed by flocking to crowded urban centers, allured by their fascination for the exciting city life. Despite this situation, with its ever-growing influence of neo-paganism and moral decadence, the traditional Catholic teaching about man, work, property, and capital continues intact. Man did not follow this teaching and created the present crisis. The wrong course of historical events Urban massification, for example, led then to a situation that, if aggravated, becomes untenable. So, the problem is real. However, the solution the progressivists are proposing for it is a false solution. The real solution does not consist, as the neo-missiology wants, in changing sound doctrine in order to cure madness. The solution lies in renouncing the madness and returning to sound Catholic religious and social doctrine.
In the big cities, there are those who, rightly attributing our present situation to human selfishness, reject the just distinction between the person of man and his egoism. For them, the person is egoism and is the enemy. Thus, the common good demands that the person become totally absorbed by the collectivity and directed by it. This is the way to avoid the infernal chaos of egoism. We see how much this view has in common with communism. A massified society without personality, without classes, and subject to a dictatorship of the anonymous proletariat. This said, let us analyze the panorama of the neo-missiology. Many missionaries who enter the Brazilian jungle have tendencies and ideas inspired by the left and progressivism. Now these progressivists see the Indians as a model for the future world. Why? Because of the similarities between tribal life and the envisioned communist society. In the tribe, there is the sharing of common goods, the complete absence of profit, capital, salaries, employers, employees, and any kind of institutions. The tribe absorbs all individual liberties of this small human group, which is non-fruitive and non-competitive. In it, men live satisfied and without problems because they have divested themselves of their egoisms. The affinity of communists with Indians does not imply the Indians are communists. An Indian people can be compared to a plant that has not grown but can still grow, whereas the neo-communists is a destroyer, the enemy of the family and property, yearning for a tribal communism. The updated missiology considers the gospel to be anti-egoist. Thus he questions the need to catechize, to spread the gospel among the Indians. Y esto nosotros lo conservamos desde nuestros antepasados. Han conservado y han valorado todos los elementos. Y ellos creían y tenían a Dios en cada de estos elementos. Ellos no fallaban, ellos eran los antropólogos, eran los científicos, eran los astrólogos que nos daban esta disciplina, esta enseñanza. No necesitaban de la Biblia, no necesitaban cualquier folleto de catequés, sino pues desde la naturaleza nos enseñaban a respetar, a cuidar, a saludar, a compartir, a vivir la cultura, la costumbre, la cosmovisión. This new missiology proposes that the gospel has already impregnated the tribal sphere so completely that it is not necessary to preach it to the native communities. Since the aim is no longer to spread the gospel, what are the goals of the updated missionary? They consist of protecting the still uncontaminated Indian tribes from the contagion of our selfish civilization. The updated missionary strives to persuade the Indian of the excellence of his present living conditions and the need to refuse the lifestyle of men who enter the jungle seeking riches and Indian manpower. He strives particularly for the Indian to reject the multinational macro-capitalism that threatens to cultivate and exploit the land. The greatest problem caused by these deliriums lies outside the missionaries and the Indians. 
It is how this philosophy managed to enter into the Holy Catholic Church with impunity, intoxicating seminaries, deforming missionaries, and inverting the very nature of the missions. This eruption of what can be called missionary communo-tribalism indicates the existence of a considerable infiltration into the Catholic structure of Brazil. How does one explain the existence and the influence of this infiltration in the Church? This is a great and difficult question. Above all, this is not a matter concerning merely Indians and missionaries. It is a matter concerning the Church and Brazil. The question is, to what extreme may both of them be dragged if this infiltration of communo-tribalism continues unchecked and remains highly esteemed in Catholic circles? The average Catholic will be able to defend himself against this progressivist influence by analyzing the texts that follow. He can then evaluate to what extent the literature of the new missiology is directed against private property and its derivatives. Further, he will be able to see how many progressivist prelates and priests discussing the Indians and their problems prepare the souls of their followers to accept the utopian communist motto, Behold the Theft, Property. What follows is a selection of seven out of 48 texts in the book by Professor Plenio.
The conclusions of the First National Assembly on Native Ministry present the Beatitudes through the lens of Communism. They stated, The Indians are still uncorrupted by the system in which we live. The Church needs to bring a real hope to the oppressed. They were brothers. They had everything in common. The Indians already live the Beatitudes. They know nothing of private property, profit, competition. They lead an essentially communitarian life in perfect equilibrium with nature. They are not plunders. They do not disturb the ecology. They live in harmony. The native communities are a future prophetic vision of this new lifestyle where man has the center place. The Indians already live the Beatitudes. This disconcerting sentence cries out for an explanation that soon follows. They know nothing of private property, profit, competition. In other words, the document sets these three elements against the perfect temporal and spiritual status of man defined by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. But what is human society without private property, profit, and competition, if not a communist society? The bishops, priests, and religious present at that meeting foresee the victory of this tribal lifestyle as a solution for human problems. They affirm that the Indian communities are the future prophetic vision of this new lifestyle where man has a center place. Next is an excerpt from the History of the Brazilian Worker, printed in the bulletin Grito no Nordeste, Shout of the Northeast, of the Archdiocese of Recife. In it, private property is presented as a source of all evils. All were equal among the Indians. The land where the tribes were located belonged to all members of the same tribe. All participated equally in the work and had the same share in the fruits of the work. Rich and poor did not exist among the Indians, nor were there any social classes. All were equal among themselves. Therefore, among them there was no robbery, crime, or prostitution. Misery and all the problems common to civilization which we have been telling ourselves have existed since God created the world, did not occur among the Indians. Obviously, it is stated here that private property is the source of all evils. A communist could not be more radical. The fruits of labor are distributed according to the communist principle, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs a slogan popularized by Marx in his 1875 critique of the Gotha program. The classless society is a communist ideal and contrary to Catholic doctrine. In his allocution of January 24, 1903, Pope Leo XIII states, The Church, preaching to men that they are all sons of the same Heavenly Father, recognizes the distinction between classes as a providential condition of human society. For this reason, the Church teaches that only reciprocal respect of rights and duties and mutual charity will yield the secret of just equilibrium, of honest well-being, of true peace and prosperity for nations. In the following statements, the Indians are presented as models for our society. The Indian community should be received as evangelizers so that they may become a model for our society, which has much to learn from them. It 
If the small Indian communities should serve as models for our society, we ask, how can those models be imitated by today's gigantic contemporary societies except by imposing a partial or complete communist regime? This is necessarily so if one accepts the picture of native societies presented by updated missiology. Bishop Tomas Balduino of Goyas, then president of the Indigenous Council, implied to a weekly paper called Opinyao that the Indians are heralds of the gospel. Today, missionary work finds evangelical values in Indian culture in such a way that not only is the Indian evangelized, but he is also capable of evangelizing us. The world of the Indian is not enclosed in itself. On the contrary, it opens itself up to a world of mystery, which brings a great equilibrium to tribal groups. Evangelization can discover the presence of Christ in the tribal group, which lives in a more Christian way than we do with our baptism and our religious practices. Without professing the name of Christ, the Indians live in a much greater fullness of the life announced by Christ, like an epistle of liberation, than we who live like pagans in our relations with each other. Now, according to this new vision of missionary work, with their communitarian regime, the Indians need nothing, not even the church since they already possess the fullness of evangelical life. If one admits this new preaching of Bishop Balduino, it becomes appropriate to ask, what is catechesis good for? Perhaps for this reason, the new catechesis is presented as concerned only with an earthly duty, which is to preserve the tribal state as seen in this text. The following pastoral plan of the Amazonian bishops is so bold that it does not need any commentary. The bishops defend the thesis that the main mission of the church is not to catechize and convert the Indian, but to guarantee his values and to guide his cultural process, such as to avoid conflicts and syncretism. In the following interview with Bishop Tomas Balduino to the newspaper Vos do Paraná, catechesis is presented as unnecessary. We do not understand catechesis as in the past, that is, transmission of a doctrine and preparation for entrance in a given period of time, initiation to worship, baptism, receiving the sacraments, etc. Today we understand catechesis in a global manner, where what prevails is the evangelizing aspect more oriented toward the restoration of the image of God in man than towards the entrance of the individual in a defined religion. So, instead of being drawn by baptism into the religious group or fraternity, the Indian is approached and encouraged to become conscious of and live the message already in him. The aim is to make the Indian understand that he can be the announcement and the denunciation of modern society, which although calling itself religious or Catholic, is egoistic, individualistic, hedonistic, greedy. As for the Indian, he is none of these things. He gives his life for the other.
The new catechesis consists much more in making the Indian conscious of the religious message that is already in his subconscious than in teaching him the good news brought by our Lord Jesus Christ to all peoples. From the Giretorio Indigena, Indian Directory, developed by the Mission Anchieta of Mato Grosso, as approved by the CNBB, according to a summary by Jornal do Brasil. The acculturation of the natives ought to be done without haste. And even traits we claim to be offensive to human nature, such as infanticide or polygamy, should be eradicated only when, and in the measure in which, the Indian can understand what is negative about these traits. The Mission Ancheta emphasizes that the Indians cannot be considered as primitive beings, having undesirable biological, psychic, and cultural characteristics. The second paragraph of the text takes the thought still dim in the first paragraph to its ultimate consequences. The Indians do not have any undesirable biological, psychic, and cultural characteristics. What about infanticide? Polygamy? These questions leap into one's mouth. Are they not the result of undesirable psychic and cultural characteristics? The text insinuates that they are not when... Referring to these aberrations, it qualifies them as traits we claim are offensive to human nature. We claim leads to a doubt. Are they really offensive to human nature? Summarizing, this presentation on tribalism discussed the Catholic and progressivist concepts of mission and how they are in conflict with each other. The Catholic mission aims to convert the Indian, baptizing him in the faith and teaching him to observe the law of God. The true missionary must also teach the Indian to use his intelligence, will, and sensibility to provide first for his own individual good in the pursuit of a virtuous life. This practice of the faith in the spiritual sphere should naturally lead the Indian to become civilized in the temporal sphere. The progressivist mission seeks not to convert the Indians, but rather to indoctrinate them with communism and confirm them in their pagan errors, encouraging them to continue their tribal customs. These progressivists take the Indian as a model because they see him as communism, taken to its radical consequences. The lifestyle of the Indian is non-fruitive, no private pleasures apart from the community, non-appropriative, no private capital or private property, and non-competitive, no competition in the pursuit of more capital. Progressivists seek to impose this neo-communist model on the church and society by convincing people that Man is an egoist, and in order for him to be cured, he must be absorbed by the group, having no individual liberty or property. Private property is an evil in itself, and capitalism, the system from which it derives, is also evil. The Beatitudes are simply humanitarian values devoid of any faith, and the Indians already live them. The Indians are innocent uncontaminated by our selfish civilization. Catholics should adopt tribalism by learning from the Indians. For more on tribalism, please see Professor Plenio's book available in the library section of our website, traditioninaction.org.